Good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the Smith Alumni Ottawa Chapter and Smith Business Insight, welcome to our discussion with Steve Goldback on his new book, Provoke, How Leaders Can Shape the Future by Overcoming Fatal Human Flaws. My name is Nilifer Erdable, and I'm CEO of Spring2 Innovation. We're an innovation and design thinking training and consulting company, helping organizations look at challenges from a human perspective from understanding clients better to reframing challenges, ideation to prototyping and testing ideas. I'm an electrical engineering 1996 Queens grad, as well as a Queens MBA 2003 graduate. Before I introduce Steve, I'd like to take a moment to first acknowledge that the Smith School of Business Kingston campus is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We're grateful to live, work, and play on these lands. A couple of housekeeping items. We want to hear from you throughout the discussion. Your engagement in the chat and q and I'll put into a uh, draw for your very own copy of Provoke. We have four books to give away today, and the winners will be announced at the end of the hour. Any questions you may have for Steve, please enter them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll make sure we save time at the end to get some questions from our audience. The chat function is also open for today. Please get it started now by telling us where in the world you're joining in from. And I've seen some other people um, are hearing this as well and seeing the chat. Kingston, Toronto, Calgary, awesome, Queens, BC, Chicago, I love it. So let's uh, start with introducing Steve. Steve Goldback is a commerce graduate from 1996, and he serves the Deloitte US partnership as chief strategy officer. He helps executives and teams transform their organizations by making challenging and pragmatic strategy choices in the face of uncertainty. He has co-authored two best-selling books, Detonate, Why and How Corporations Must Blow Up, best practices and bring a beginner's mind to survive and provoke how leaders shape the future by overcoming fatal flaws, which is one of the Wall Street Journal's bestsellers list. Welcome, Steve. Thanks so much, Nilifer. Nice to be here. Thanks. We have a lot of people on the line eager to hear about the book and your experiences. So let's get started. So uh, in your book, which uh, I have a copy of, and I also have it on Audible too, uh, I've really enjoyed reading it. And in the book, you talk a lot about provoking the future. And so what do you mean by provoke? Is there a difference between provoking and creating the future? And, and as you're answering that, uh, <laughs> sorry, we're going to put up a poll too for our audience too. Um, how would you rate your organization's capability today in provoking the future? And so, um, Steve, what do you mean by provoke? And is there a difference between provoking and creating the future? So um, I think we wanted to be sharper than just create, because create is very general. Um, when we were looking for titles for the book, we considered um, we considered words like instigate, but unfortunately, my my father has a uh, a patent on that with my with his granddaughter. He's the instigator, and so we didn't want to go with instigate. But provoke felt to us like what we were doing was. Um, is eliciting a response from the marketplace, from uh, consumers. And so many times what Jeff and I, Jeff Tuff, my co-author, found in our find in our practice is that uh, the, the executives we work with would say, well, we're going to wait for the marketplace to evolve and then we will, we will respond. And actually, we think that that's increasingly the wrong choice. They need to, they need to, make the marketplace respond. They need to provoke the response. Um, in Detonate, we, we, we tell a short story about how in a poker tournament one time, um, I ended up winning because what I just ended up doing to my opponent was bet, bet, bet every time. And that would give me information on how strong her hand was. Um, and so what we're trying to do is encourage people to, uh, to actually make the marketplace respond to your stimulus and we think that that's in a changing world. That's a much better way to uh, to create the future. And then creating is just a little more generic. So that was the reason for uh, selecting that, uh, Nilifer. 
I love that. And, uh, and for you, Steve, is the future something that comes no matter what we expect, or is it something we create or co-create? I, I, th I think the future is not preordained. Um, the future, uh, we, we, I think some subsegment, and it's usually a small segment of the population, is going to create the future, right? They're not going to wait. It doesn't just magically happen. Um, you know, someone, someone does it. It's, I'm sort of like, I've been reading Harry Potter with my, with my daughter and I'm reminded of that scene and sorry, spoiler alert for the, for people who haven't, for the two of you that haven't read it yet, but like he casts his Patronus in number three and he sits there waiting for, he's saying, don't worry, my father's going to come. My father casts the Patronus, he's going to come. And then he's like, well, he's not coming, so I better do it, right? That's the way the future gets created. Someone chooses to act right? The future doesn't magically get created when people stand by and wait. And so it's, are you going to be some of the people who are going to stand up and act and create the future? Or are you going to be waiting for the future to happen to you? I believe, and Jeff and I believe that the, in business now, the choice to wait and let the marketplace happen to you is increasingly a choice that puts you not just on your back foot and not just positions you as a fast follower, but actually could be a um, choice between survival and not surviving, right? The way industries are evolving these days, the first, the person who creates the industry is increasingly up to such a head start that it's hard to catch up. And so the choosing not to act um, could position you as a wind down firm. Yeah. And in the book you talk of, and yeah, you use the phrase very frequently, do something just mm -hmm. so that you can figure out what the market is going to be doing too. And uh, as we put out the poll earlier, how would you rate your organization's capability today in provoking the future? Uh, a lot of people said, actually 45% said that we're good in spots, but not consistent. And then in second place was we wait until trends are proven before acting, but eventually catch up. So really similar to, to what you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's a learned skill. Like this is, not, this is not something that is like all of a sudden we were born with the uh, ability to do this naturally. It's something that organizations have to, have to practice and, and get better at. Yeah, and uh, I know uh, as you and I were chatting too uh, before this session, you had mentioned that if people really want something, then they'll succeed. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Because that was such an interesting comment. Yeah, if they, if if you look, I I think if you are, you know, for me, it's it's a if you desire something, if you say I'm going to fight for this thing or I'm going to make it happen, it's a question of the priority you you put you put on it. And I think when organizations decide that they're going to reinvent the future and they're committed and they're committed to it they act in ways they make they make choices that uh winners make i mean look uh, you know now that i've been living in the states i've got to come up with a, 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 a um, an nfl you know response it's like people love to look i hate using sports analogies because people think that they're um masculine or feminine or not are not are not are not gender neutral but i think everybody knows tom brady right and tom brady you know, made choices uh, in his lifestyle that enabled him to play until he was 45 years old at the highest levels of any sport. I think we can all agree on it, whether or not you're like me and I dislike the New England Patriots and, and the Tampa Bay Bucks. Um, but he did things like he focused on different elements of his fitness. He ate differently. He slept, he went to bed at 830 every night, right? So he wasn't sitting up uh, he wasn't sitting up uh, and watching TV or even being with his family. He went to bed at 8.30 and got lots of sleep. These were choices that he made and nobody else made. I think similarly, when Uber decided that it was going to own the market for ride hailing services, in its early markets, what it did was it made sure that it had enough, it paid drivers to be on the road so that nobody would ever have a long wait for the car, even in those early nascent stages of the marketplace. So they got great signals from the market because they were flooding the market and paying people uh, and, and paying drivers to be on the road. And so that, like, these are the kinds of things that 
people who really want to create the future are willing to do and people who sit back and say, well, I'll see, I'll see what happens. And, you know, nothing rarely happens when you do something in a, you know, uh, half-assed kind of way, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. And a lot of people in the chat are uh, agreeing with you there too, is you have to take the risk to, to get ahead and make sure you're uh, watching the market too. Um, for this book that you wrote, um, what drove you to write this book and, and what's the link between this and your previous book, Detonate? So I can't say boredom during the pandemic caused me to write a book. Can't, no, <laughs> uh, actually what we ended up starting to, uh, starting to write the, the book right at the start of the pandemic. So interestingly, this is a book that is a hundred percent written, uh, on zoom. So Jeff and I, the first time we saw each other, in person after having after having completed the book was to take the picture that is on the on the front cover which is in those you know early wonderful stages of you know post you know post original wave pre delta so we were able to get together for a little while um, we wh what we noticed was that people detonate was a bit of a call to action to saying we have to do different things than we've done in the past we can't rely on the playbooks in the past. And the question that we got asked most often was like, how do we do that? What's the things to do? Like, I, I get that we need to do, we need to generally do different things, but what is it that we, what, what is it that we should do? So we wanted to come up with a bit more of a framework for what it would, what it takes to create the future and to do different things. And part of that was setting up the frame that um, it's not, this is hard because we're human not because like we're just silly or you know poorly educated or the thing it's because it's actually because we're human and then where does it matter if you know w w your actions matter where you sit in terms of the evolution of the marketplace so if you're at a really early and nascent stage of marketplace evolution you will do different things and if you're responding after you know after sort of the horse has left the barn if that makes sense yeah yeah totally i love that and, uh, and so uh, in the book, Provoke, you actually talk a lot about trends. And so we end up encountering anomalies in our businesses. How do we know whether they're worth paying attention to or not? And how do we know when an anomaly is going to turn into a trend versus staying as an anomaly? Yeah. So I'll answer the second part first, then I'll talk, and then I'll talk about the first part. So you, you don't. So the, 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 answer to the, the answer to the question is how do you know whether anomaly is going to become a trend or not is you, you don't know at the beginning. It's an anomaly. Um, and um, the way that you can, what you need to do is actually to answer your first question is figure out which, anomal, which anomalies, if they became trends, would either present opportunities that were so amazing or be so threatening to your business model that if you weren't prepared, you would be risking the business. And that's the sort of the questions you have to be asking yourself for which ones you pay attention to, because there's lots of anomalies and some of them may evolve into, into trends as well, but do they matter to your business? So the first lens is ask yourself the question is, is if, the, if this anomaly became more pervasive, right? What would like, would it matter or not, right? That's, a, that's the, the first question. Um, and uh, and we th and there's a story in the first chapter of the book of how this is what I think executives get you know get wrong is because they just they ignore it they say it's an anomaly right and so the first story of the book was from um, a meeting I had with a uh, cable TV executive and I I won't name the company here in the U S who we took to them some an anomaly we we did we had done some work. Um, for another company who gave us permission to talk to this other company. And, and we found that there was about 1.75% of the viewing market who did not want to have any television programming coupled with their internet. They wanted really great internet, but they didn't want all the TV stuff that came with it. They just wanted what the industry would call naked internet. And so the, the cable executives, the first response was, well, they're just poor, right? And it's like, okay, well what, well, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, they can't afford to have that stuff. And we looked at the data and we said, actually, no, they sort of, they skew, they have money all over the place. 
Um, so they, they, there's some that aren't, you know, are less than an average household income, and there's some that have, you know, considerably higher income. And uh, as as we dug into it, it turned out they just they just wanted good internet. And what they were doing was, if we looked at their behaviors, they were finding other sources for the television program that they were watching. Of yeah. course, this was the first anomaly that turned into cord cutting and, you know, spit out business models like Netflix and, and other, and other major, and other major businesses that had that particular cable executive back in around 2007, 2008, done something about it, pulled on that thread a bit, exhibited some curiosity, then, you know, that there, there was more that they can do. And if you look at the stock market valuation of Netflix compared to the direction of travel for uh, that particular company, it's it's considerably uh, it's a it's a vastly different story when that company actually had all the infrastructure necessary to create Netflix's Netflix's business model. And so at the time, so how do you know, like how do you know when an anomaly is starting to become a trend? You got to ask yourself, is it feasible? Right? Can I actually technically do uh, what it's going to do? Is it um, desirable? Right? Is it something that you know consumers would want? And consu it's like from that standpoint, it's like, well, of course, consumers would want to be able to watch shows when they want, whenever they want, not on someone else's timeline. Versus, you have to watch it when I'm airing it, and that's the only option. So, giving people more flexibility, that's naturally more desirable, and then viable is can I make money on it, right? Can I, can I actually, is there a business model that allows me to make money? And I think that's, you know, someone is going to put the investment out to do that. So that's sort of how you decide. So you have to, you know, decide whether it's important to your business. And as it emerges, you look for that feasibility, desirability, viability framework to, uh, to check. Yeah, I love that. And then the other, um uh, and as you're talking about the viability component too, is um, you're offering something that's giving your end clients more uh, of what they want. And then it's how do you price it so that uh, you can still make a profit, understanding that it might not be as much as before and still go forward with it too. Yeah. And I think this is where... You, this, this is a this is a such a major challenge for executives when they say, "But I'm making lots of money now at this other thing," and the the challenge is, well, you're comparing something that is today, you know, not necessarily going to be the case in the future. So I can make less money. I I might have to make less money in the future, but I will be making that money. Versus if someone else chooses to do it. And they put me out of business, you know, that's, I'm making no money. And this is the funny thing about risk aversion, Nilifer, that we found is that people, like the, the big challenge is that people say, woo, stat, you know, doing something different, that's risky. Status quo, that's really safe. But it's like the, the unfortunate, and, and it may feel that way in our, in our, given our cognitive biases that we have. Right, we it, we may feel that the status quo is safer, but doing something different is risky. But in reality, in a fast-moving industry, the opposite is true. Doing the same thing over and over again is actually really risky, and doing and trying something new is way better than the status quo. And so, what we have to do is flip the orthodoxies of the boardroom to say, whenever someone says we should do the same thing, someone should say, "Isn't that incredibly risky?" Um, but that's not the, that's not the case. So, but it's definitely not the case uh, from what I'm seeing, actually, or what I've seen in the past. It's uh, it's definitely the opposite. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about status quo, but before we do, I'm actually really curious to hear what are some of the anomalies that you're seeing today that you're paying attention to. Well, I think the one that I think it's it's hard to say it's it's an anomaly anymore. But the one that the thing that I'm seeing is obviously lots of people are talking about hybrid work. Right and hybrid. What is it? Is hybrid work going to be the wave of the future or not? And this is one that you know. In the book, we talk about the notion of an if to when, yeah. right? And 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 in, to use the language we've been using, this is when at the very early stages of an if, it's a, more of an anomaly, and then eventually it goes through a phase change, where you know where it it it, it hits all those points of feasibility, desirability, and viability, and then it's not a question of if. 
it will come to fruition. It's a question of when it will come to fruition. And uh, with hybrid work, I think we are, and we have been for some time now, we are well past the point of if it is going to be the dominant model versus, you know, it will be the dominant model. And the, 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 the challenge I see that's happening is that executives are still framing the question around, should we go back to the office or not? Right. It's sort of like this binary thing. It's like we're either going back to the office or we're going, you know, or we're remote. And I think the, the question I would just uh, encourage executives responsible for this choice to be doing is to instead of saying um, is is hybrid work or not the future. Right. I think it obviously is the future because so many um, working parents can have more flexibility in their lives. You can fit other things in. You get the opportunity to have a much more, uh, uh, a, you, you have access to a workforce that is more available to you than what the ones in your geography. But we also know that it's not gonna be 100% and you have to figure out the model that works best for your business. And that's a question that everyone needs to customize, right? It's not like what we're gonna do at Deloitte is gonna make sense for uh, a, you know, a, uh, a global technology company, or it might be different for a, a, a business that is much more uh, customer, uh, customer facing in person. So you just, we know it's hybrid, that's not a debate, but what form of hybrid is the question, right? What form of hybrid and what's the specific nature of your hybrid business and how does it, how do you customize it for you? So that's the, um, you know, that's the question I'd be asking. Yeah, I like that. How do you customize it for you uh, aspect of it too. Um, as, as you were saying earlier too on the status quo comp uh, component of it, um, there is a lot in terms of uh, how organizations work and this, this risk averseness to move away from status quo. And, um, and so when we're Looking at organizations, I see a lot of organizations that might end up punishing leaders that actively change strategy that then sometimes ends in short-term profit losses. And then there's those that are passively endorsing the old status quo strategies, and there's still profit loss happening with that too. Uh, there seems to be a difference in terms of how they are rewarded and, and how long they stay on in organizations as well. Can you talk a little bit about uh, that status quo bias too in organizations and how leaders make decisions? Yeah, and look, I think there's a lot of factors that that create um, a bias towards the status quo in organizations. So let's 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 break it down into a few different a few different things. First of all, there is a real human cognitive bias that has nothing to do with organizations that has everything to do with just human beings being human beings like we are loss averse and deviating from the status quo is for a lot of people uh, like perceived to be a risky thing and there's probably a small subset of people who really love and embrace change and that's just fun for them it's stimulating but for most human beings like deviating from the status quo is a scary thing so there's the like, oh my God, I got to do something different or I'm comfortable doing what I'm doing. And that's an inertia that is uh, just about being a human being and we all suffer from it. Then the things that, you know, what we observe in organizations that I think is generally true, of course, there's probably exceptions to everything, but a general truism is as organizations grow and get larger, they, they put in place increasingly um, stringent's the wrong word, but systematic like uh, management systems to get their arms around the business, right? They want to have more control over the business than not. And so those management systems encourage human behavior to be in a certain box, right? Like think of every time you've called a customer service rep and the answer out of their uh, the answer out of their mouths was, I'm sorry, I can't do that. It's against company policy. And every time someone says that to me, I'm like, well, okay, can you explain why the company policy is that? Because I don't think this situation, you know, I don't think this situation uh, applies. 
And then I get like, you know, then I get, and my wife just is screaming at me in the background saying, what are you trying to do now? You're going to, you're going to wreck that person's day. Um, but that's the kind of thing that companies do. Um, they put in place these management systems to increase control. And that makes it harder to get people to behave differently unless you create management systems that encourage people to behave differently and respond to the marketplace. So the, the uh, one simple example I love is what happens if you go into a Starbucks and you get your drink and, and they mess up your drink, right? They just... They just I usually take my drink, but yeah. what happens? Because well, you're, you're such a kind Canadian, but, you know us, you know us New Yorkers, you know say excuse me, this is wrong, and they always just say they always just say, well, you know, uh, that's great, we'll fix it for you, right? Whereas in lots of companies, though, we'll just fix it for you. It requires well, I got to ask a manager if I can do that. Let me get back to you. They've decided that it's so important to their service that that's going to be a management system that they have. That's going to be a reward recognition for their employees. They're not going to ask any questions. In fact, employees get rewarded for, for doing things like that. And so you can, leaders need to decide to create an organizational system that actually is consistent with exhibiting behaviors that are responsive to the marketplace. And it doesn't happen by magic. So it's not just magical that someone is innovative. You've given people the permission and the psychological safety in order to do so. And so I see someone did write, uh, oh, Wanda wrote in the thing, Nordstrom is another great example, right? It's you know, organizations around service is, that are orchestrated around service give a lot more latitude to their people. Organizations who are oriented around control are, um, are you know, are harder. And everyone always says, well, you know, what, how do we prevent this and that from happening? And, and you've, you've got you've to design systems that allow that allows some deviation from the norm if you want to be provoking the future. If you want to do the same thing you've been doing, then it's easy to manage that business. But it, then it makes you more susceptible to that business changing. Just ask, you know, the, the, the taxi medallion owners, right, in any, in any, yeah. in any major city. Yeah, and also uh, I think it was uh, when we were chatting earlier too, you mentioned that organizations don't make decisions it's people that make decisions. And so empowering people to make those decisions to, to do right by the customers and to make uh, the situations uh, better so that customers keep coming back and you have that loyalty built in. A hundred percent, but I think it, it, it extends even beyond that, right? I think it, extend, it extends beyond, you know, just like the, the customer facing employees. It, like everyone needs to realize that they, that they are part of the we when they say we would never do that, yeah. right? Like, like how many times have you been working in an organization and you suggest some change and then the answer is, well, we would never do that, right? And, and, who, and, and increasingly my question back is who's the we, right? Who's, who's the we in that question? Because senior, uh, senior management is senior management for a reason. Like you always have the choice. Or you hear the you hear the the one where it's like our culture would never accept it. Well, then culture is to me. I so the Jeff and I are are at some point going to write a third book, and we've been toying with the opening line that you know where we're going to take on Peter Drucker's quote that says culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think that that's BS. Culture is a strategy choice. What promotes culture? The way you reward people, the way you incentivize them. We behave a particular way because the way leaders explicitly and implicitly reward your behavior. Do they promote you for doing good things? Do they, do they, do they yell at you? So I, I don't think culture eats strategy for breakfast. I think setting your culture is, is, a strategy, is a strategy choice that executives need to make. And I just think too many executives view this as something they have no control over. And I love so, that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I can't that. wait to read that book. Honestly, I would pick that up instantly. Well, I got, I got, I got a lot, like I got like <laughs> four lines written now. So that's, about, <laughs> you got a long ways to wait. Sorry. <laughs> On the way. Yeah. Well, in this one, I think a lot of people uh, really loved uh, that you're talking about uh, fatal human flaws in business too. Um, and so uh, what are the fatal human flaws that prevent us from uh, seeing the trends and acting on them? 
And then also uh, you talked about humans as uh, assuming the future is linear extension of the past, but it really isn't. And you touched on that a earlier. Can you talk a little bit about the, the fatal human flaws? And yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Let me let you finish your question. No, all good. Okay. So like the fatal human flaws are a set of cognitive biases that just put like when you, when you, when you couple those human flaws with the way that we all behave in large organizations, you have, um, you know, that, that creates blinders that prevent you from seeing the, that prevent you from seeing the, the future. I would call on a couple of cognitive biases to just share, share the example. We've already talked about the status quo bias. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, 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 another one called the egocentric bias. And I'm by no means a cognitive uh, psychology effort though. Shout out to Professor Julian Barling for originally <laughs> introducing me to this, uh, these, these things back at, at, at in Com 381, no, not 381, 389, um, uh, back at, back at, back at, at Smith. But, you know, the egocentric bias is where we overweight information. Um, we overweight information that is consistent with our own point of view, right? It's the, look, it, it's the reason why uh, we are so polarized here in the United States, right? Because we hear someone's point of view and we overweight those opinions that happen to coincide with our own as opposed to seeking out um, disconfirming evidence. So we, uh, we see that. We also have a problem and we also have a bias where things that are, it's called the availability bias, where information that is just easily available to us, whether it's physically or uh, mentally available to us because it's consistent with our views, we incorporate that more into our decision-making processes. And there's a number of those cognitive biases that just prevent you from incorporating a more fulsome worldview into your perspective. Because how do we make a decision, right? We can't possibly see all the data uh, available to us around us, all the information that's available, right? And so we select, as human beings, we select some of this. And that's where the biases come in. We select it, we select information, right? And, and then we do some you know, brain analysis on it, we draw a conclusion, right? But if we're selecting information and that doesn't represent the whole picture, then we're going to make flawed, we're going to make flawed decisions. And so the one thing I would say in order to overcome these biases, the most important thing is to introduce diversity into your teams, introduce cognitive diversity. And by the way, cognitive diversity stems from real world diversity. Why is that? Because people with diverse backgrounds are subject to different biases and therefore they select different information, right? And if their perspectives are heard and included and debated, then you're much more likely to see the whole picture rather than parts of the picture when the organizations are making choice. But if you fill a room full of, you know, frankly, old white men, all subject to the same cognitive biases, um, who select the same information and process it in the same way and draw conclusions, you're going to get a very uh, unrepresentative view of what the world actually looks like. So if you want to overcome these fatal flaws, the most important and easily, you know, it's not easy, but the thing that you can act on the most is to make sure that you've got um, a, a cognitively diverse team. I, I love that uh, for sure. Um, so as, uh, as we're talking about your book too, I want to come back to so many different things here. Uh, just even in uh, chatting, uh, we were talking about our Queens experience and sometimes just everyone having gone to Queens have a certain experience that we're familiar with. And then when you go out and talk to people from other schools, they have completely different experiences of university. And so having those diversity and thoughts, even in, in schools really helps out. Um, within the book, uh, you talked about the quintet. And so uh, seeing the future uh, and you called it envision preparing for change position, creating an and, uh, impact that's advantageous to you, so the drive component, and then shifting business models to create inevitable outcomes, the adapt and trigger a network effect, activate. And yeah. so a number of organizations tried bits of these, some try all of these. 
where in that quintet do you see businesses failing the most? And, and we actually have a poll too uh, for our audience. Which of the following provocation approaches have you used? And click uh, all those that apply. And so Steve, for you, um, uh, where in the quintet do you see businesses failing the most? So just real simply for, for folks. So the envision, position, drive, act, uh, activate, adapt um, should is really about where you sit in that if to when, in that if to when uh, journey. So the earlier on in the journey, you um, you know you can be using strategies like envision and position when it's still an if, and then as it shifts to a when, you've got to you're more in reactive mode. So either you're trying to drive something into the marketplace or you're trying to push a change in, you're trying to activate other folks, but it's already passed. And then you're at the adapt one is where you just are literally trying to get out of the way of an oncoming train or, you know, you will get hit. Um, I, I think companies, unfortunately, are overusing adapt, right? They're waiting so long that they're only left with, um, they're only left with a strategy that says, I'm going to adapt to the new marketplace. The moral equivalent would be um, how many companies were in China on the ground in the 1980s, right? When it was obvious that China was going to be a large economy, how many people were doing skunk works to deal with that, to kind of understand how they do it versus, you know, hey, China's a big market. Maybe we should have an approach to, you know, to, to working on it. Um, that sort of became the general response to, you know, dealing with China and the other brick companies is we're just going to plunk down there. And so many companies have had their hats handed to them because they didn't understand the market. They didn't understand local competition. And I know there's lots and lots going on in the chat about Uber, but Uber got their hat handed to them in China by Didi. Um, and that's a good example of where you can't just extend another business model to another market, but that's adapt, right? I'm just going to, there's a big thing there. I'm just going to go there, right? That's usually the least effective strategy because, you know, the strategies in the middle position drive and, and, and activate are more, well, you're trying to shape the marketplace, but you have to do different things. So you can't just say, I, wouldn't it be great if I could drive? It's like, well, you have to be in a position to be able to exert influence on the market and you have to have a, tr uh, you know, a something that's along the if to when journey where you're pushing it over the over the edge. The one important thing that everybody can do, though, is do the work and envision. And that's where you sit and you imagine how the world might be different than it is today. And you don't want to just do that and create one story. You want to create multiple different ways the future, uh, the future could evolve. And that's a, and, and that's something that I think people need to be doing. There's a technique called scenario thinking that um, is an important one for Envisor. I, I love that. Yeah, I love the scenario concept of it. Um, what about Deloitte? What are they doing and where has Deloitte perhaps been slower? Yeah, I, I, look, I would, um, you know, we are not, uh, we are not perfect. We are subject to uh, similar things. I'm very proud of the, I'm very proud of the uh, progress we've made um, on a number of things, in, in, in particular, uh, our adoption of technology, uh, our growing of our business with our with uh, alliance partners, um, we were very quick, and we are, and we have been excellent at um, working together with many of the with many of the hyperscalers to be ahead of some of the uh, the trends. We've been able to be very, and we were great at, I think, migrating very quickly to hybrid. Uh, even in our, um, e even in the part of our business, which is housed in India, where we had done pre-pandemic drills uh, with bring your laptop home, so we didn't miss a beat when you know our people couldn't go into our delivery centers in in Hyderabad. You know, I think we've got we've got work to do um, on a number of different areas. I'd love to see us be more agile. I'd love to see us be uh, more responsive. But when you're the uh, you know, when you've got 300,000 people plus around the world, you know, being agile, you know, takes some work. So I think we've got some work to, to do there, but we're, we're working on it. 
I love that. And I forgot uh, to uh, take a look at the poll results that we had. Uh, yeah, so this is great. So a lot of organizations, so which of the following provocation approaches have you used? And a lot of people have used the Envision um, as well. In second place, the Drive. It's pretty evenly spread, eh? Oh yeah, actually Adapt is fairly heavy too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's really great to see that uh, people have tried the various areas, but uh, I liked your uh, your idea on uh, spending a little bit more time in the Envision and the scenarios component of it too. And, and we're getting a lot of great uh, comments in the chat as well that I'm kind of looking at. Uh, and uh, a few people had uh, mentioned uh, nonprofits in there and uh, I saw a little discussion on, on healthcare. And so uh, maybe uh, the next question might help uh, in this area too is, um, I, I, I personally really enjoyed the provokers that you talked about at the end of the book. And uh, they had a lot of common traits uh, that made them great provokers. And uh, you touched on uh, some areas of nonprofit as well, too. Could you talk a little bit about the common behaviors and attitudes of those provokers that made them great provokers? Yeah, I, and, and I see uh, Tom's got a question that is on this. Uh, Tom Sheldon has a question that's on this topic, so we can cover that, we can cover that one off, too. Um, so the, 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 I would say, first of all, there is no, um, there is no, like provoke like personality like I, I like we, as we were profiling uh debbie ryan and valerie uh in the book you know everyone says like what are the four things you need to do they're all you know incredibly amazing people and they're also very different ryan is a ryan is a massive introvert you know debbie will turn a conversation and so ryan gravel for those who haven't read the book was the designer behind the uh, atlanta Beltline, which is one of the uh, most massive infrastructure projects uh, in the world right now. Debbie Beal is the founder, uh, the founder of Posse, which is an organization that takes underprivileged uh, kids and sends them to uh, sends them to university. And her, the insight she discovered was that if you send kids with their Posse, right, with the kids from their neighborhood, they're much more likely to. Uh, perform well in uh, at the schools that they went to, and then Valerie Rainford, who was the uh, uh, the leader of J.P. Morgan Chase's uh, Black uh, Talent Initiative uh, for Jamie Dimon, uh, where they uh, they did a massive upgrade in how many uh, Black executives they had throughout the throughout the organization. She's founded a, a company called Ellery Talent Strategies. They are all different. I think the one thing that they've got in common that I would call out Nilifer is that they're all super curious about the human experience, right? And at the end of the day, if you wanna be provoking and you wanna be provoking change in a human being, you've gotta be sufficiently curious about what drives that behavior change. And if you're not curious, you won't under, you know, you won't do it. Like Ryan, you know, got his curiosity by you know, living in Atlanta and saying it's so boring driving in my car everywhere. And then he went to Paris and he got to watch everyone. He said, wouldn't it be amazing if I could bring a little bit of that ability to look and interact with other people to Atlanta? And hence the Beltway. It's designed, it was conceived on a trip to Paris. Um, and so that, that that's just, I'd say. And then, and for me, the nonprofit part of this is just, if my goal is to create a better future, to provoke a better future for the world, I can apply the same thinking to ESG and other important uh, ways that we can make the world a better place by applying the same principles than I can on, um, you know, can I create a great business out of this? I love that. Thank you. Um, maybe we should uh, flip over the Q&A area. We're kind of naturally doing that as well, too. I, I feel like we could talk all day. Is there, have you had a chance to look at the... Uh, the question, Steve, or, or do you want me to pick a couple? Well, of... why don't you pick? I'm sort of scrolling through, and it, it like you drive Nilifer. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> there's uh, there's actually uh, two that are standing out for me, just in terms of the work that we do as well. Too, can a company make an anomaly into a trend by focusing on it? Absolutely. I think that's the whole point of position and drive. So just like I, I know, I know, I created a controversy by mentioning Uber earlier, um, uh, and and I'm not endorsing 
their model. I'm simply saying they did create the market. Um, I'll give you another uh, example and uh, of creating uh, creating a trend. Um, look, we I think people can disagree or, or or not that whether or not people love going to the grocery store. It's my personal observation that if you were given a choice between doing your shopping or having someone do it for you, more people would choose to not have to go to the store than to go to the store for pleasure. And I think the pandemic has started to bring that to fold with more curbside pickup and things of that sort. There are now companies in New York, and I'm kidding you not, um, that will deliver groceries to your home and in six minutes. Oh my God. <laughs> six minutes, okay? So um, they, are, they are buying up uh, storefront property in neighborhoods and using them as dark stores to, and, and employing a large delivery workforce to get you like decent, good quality groceries. Like not, you're not trading off what you would get at Whole Foods or someone like that. You're like getting good groceries in six minutes. And so you can create the future by just showing people like this is better, get people to try it. This is a better model. And sure enough, it's like, look, I used to give a lot of my uh, grocery shopping dollars to different uh, neighborhood groceries, but you know what? If you can get it to my door in six minutes, I, it takes it takes me longer to get my daughter's boots on than <laughs> six minutes. So we're we're gonna do that. So I think that the key thing is is like, can you create a trend out of anomaly? The answer is yes. You just have to invest enough money behind getting people to try it and showing them that it's better if it's not patently obvious that it is. And that's one that you just invest in trial, make people try it. I love that. Um... Another question that I have uh, in the Q and A's that I'm seeing is: uh, What model do you propose to assess the execution of an of an innovation, and how do you assess if or when to stop? Yeah, I think you, I, uh, my my co-author Jeff is is likes to rail on the stage gate system, and the reason why he likes to rail on the stage gate system is because at every point in a stage gate process, we're basically, you know, oh, you know, we're basically, you know, sh uh, uh, sanding the idea down to its, you know, most agreeable form. Like I can only make, like, only make money if the, if the idea is predictable and I can, you know, put a question on a survey that a consumer would indicate that they would, that they would buy it. The way we would like to conduct innovation is at every stage of the innovation process, have a hypothesis that you need to see proven out in order to get to the next stage. So for like the companies um, that are doing these dark stores and these super fast delivery services, I don't, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to over, um, I don't want to overturn, um, uh, I don't want to overturn the, um, the, the, the model based on whether I can make money at the start. I want to see whether I can drive people's behavior, right? I want to, I want to see, can I get people to adopt the new thing because it's better for them, um, because it's a better, uh, a better behavior. And that is, um, and that's the first stage. Can you get people to do the behavior that they want to do? Um, and then, then ask, does that behavior scale, right? Does that behavior, can I get enough people to do it? So you're asking different questions at every stage of the innovation process. So first, can I get just a handful of early adopters to do it? Then, you know, how much, then I'm learning a bit more about my business model. How much will it cost to deliver that service? How much money in marketing do I need to uh, promote to do it? And then, and then, um, and then can it make money? So just, if you ask the can it make money stage too quickly, um, then, then I think you get, um, then I think you get into a, then I think you get into a problem. That's where these massive technology companies, but you got to get to the make money question eventually. Otherwise you're just, you, you, you will not be a profitable enterprise. Yeah. I, I love that aspect of it for sure. And so a lot of uh, prototyping earlier on, and then as you're moving through with the hypothesis experimentation, uh, as you build it out and just, uh, determining the market viability as well. Um, 
if you're okay, uh, there's another question here that sounds interesting. Uh, how should the public sector leaders think about recruitment and retention crisis in the mental health and addictions health sector, given that the structural changes that have happened because of the virtual and because of the new competition or options available, um, such as private practice and new options within private industry, what do you do in the face of the great or sustained resignation? Yeah, so I, look, the, the great resignation has, uh, I think the hybrid workforce is gonna create more options for, um, uh, for workers in general to negotiate with their organization for what's important to them. I think, um, you know, I, I do think companies uh, w right now, the way that they've responded has been basically with, basically with um, they've been throwing money at the great resignation. And that's a, you know, certainly it's a good thing when um, workers get paid more. I think in the future, the good thing is that it's creating more competition for, you know, for, uh, for workers. And that's going to be only a good thing where people can self-select into the situation that's best for them. Um, and so to some of the people who are wondering whether I was envisioning a future for the rich, I'll say, I'll say here, you know, no, I think actually this is a great, th this trend is great for families, family with kids, people who can't afford daycare, because with more competition for, and more availability for uh, workers to have jobs that are right for them, you know, companies can compete in ways that don't aren't just about paying more, but like I'm going to offer childcare, or I'm going to offer flexible hours, or I'm going to offer you to work from home these days. The thing that we did that we never did before the pandemic was we just conducted an, a mass experiment about what's possible in the way we work, and we've discovered as a society that we have way more flexibility than we ever thought we had, and that flexibility will create incredible value for all levels of society because it creates more alternatives for people to self-select into the things that are right for them. So it's good that people are leaving jobs and they're gonna go find a job that allows them to self-optimize. to self -optimize. And companies, I think, will have to figure out and have to wrestle with, you know, it's not just gonna be about, you know, paying more money, although I think in general, we will see the, the rise in wages that we're seeing. Um, I, it's gonna be about what else are you surrounding um, what else are you surrounding in my, in my employment? Is it about what I'm learning? Is it about the benefits you're creating? Is it about, um, is it about my ability to grow? Uh, am I in a culture that allows me? And that will just, the more options you create, the better people can self-select into the things that are best for them and their families. I love that. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. You touched a little bit on uh, ESG, there's a question in here on what's your view over the current ESG trend in companies? Would it sustain over the long run? I, I think a hundred percent. Our planet, our, um, our planet depends on it. And I think the way it's going to manifest itself is that more people, whether it's employees, uh, customers are going to be to, to the point that we were just talking about are going to be voting with their feet on issues around ESG, okay? Whether it's uh, diversity in the workforce, uh, whether it's uh, commitment to climate change, um, whether it's modern slavery, uh, th this is, these are issues that people are going to increasingly look to work and buy from companies that are making an impact that uh, that is positive to society. And society is a stakeholder for all businesses, and I think businesses that ignore it do so at their at their peril. And so I think the thing to make sure that uh, we do is create a society where access to information about what companies do in this regard is uh, as available as it can. And I was very proud that Deloitte published our first, you know, highly granular transparency report about our workforce. Uh, and our commitment to diversity, but I think companies have a, we got help on that. We got help from Valerie Rainford uh, on how to do that. And so look, look, we, 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 you know, society has a long way to go, but I think the way that it's going to manifest itself is as people vote with their feet. I love that. Thank you. 
Um, we're actually getting close to the end of our time. And so I'm actually gonna uh, pass it over to Kevin. So please welcome Kevin to the virtual stage. He's gonna wrap up the event and announce our winners and uh, talk a little bit about some upcoming events. So, hey, Kevin, welcome on board. Thanks, Neil. Uh, so as Bill said, my name is Kevin Horseman and I am a, a member of the Smith Alumni Ottawa chapter executive uh, along with Neil. And I also happen to be a, a director with Deloitte's Transformational Change Practice here in Ottawa. So I was doubly excited to, to see Steve here today. Thanks for, for joining us, Steve. Uh, first off, on behalf of the Smith Alumni Ottawa chapter and the Smith Business Insight, thank you to both Nilfer and Steve for a great discussion today and to our audience for engagement throughout. I saw some fantastic questions and a great deal of discussion happening on the chat, which I think is a, a sign of uh, uh, you know the, the relevance of the topic and the, and the fact that people were very keen to hear what you had to say on this. So thank you very much again. That was a, a fantastic discussion. I'm also happy to announce our four book winners. Uh, and apologies if I mispronounce any of these names, but uh, here are our winners for today. We have Allison Story, Mesh Amancalo, Dominic Vanderbilt, and Christopher Horley. The Smith alumni team will be in touch following the event to confirm your address and get your prize to you. So congratulations to the four of you. And, uh, and Steve, they'll be, uh, they'll be reading your book very shortly. Awesome. All right. Uh, we also wanted to let you know that we have another great event coming up next week, Lights, Camera, Action, the Business of Sport, which is happening on February 9th at 12 p.m. Eastern. And that's going to be hosted by the uh, Smith Alumni Toronto chapter and moderated by Jock Climby and featuring an impressive alumni panel of industry experts. Don't miss the panel discussion exploring the business of sport that will explore insights and lessons in the areas of technological innovation, talent management, and inclusivity. And the link to register is in the chat if you're interested. You can see uh, here on the slide as well. So I'm definitely looking forward to that as a sports fan myself. It uh, should be very interesting. Before we wrap, I'd also like to bring your attention to a great resource for business leaders. Smith Business Insight is jam-packed with articles based on the research and expertise of Smith faculty. Everything from how to be a better leader to managing hybrid teams and much more. You can also sign up for the monthly newsletter and get stories delivered straight to your inbox. So check it out at smithqueens.com insight. We are at time. So once again, folks, thank you very much for joining today. Nilifer, Steve, thank you again for a fantastic discussion. And we wish everyone a great rest of the day and we'll touch base soon. Take care, folks.